couple things to note before the meeting. First, uh, and I apologize for this, but there was some um, kind of confusion among the board while well, basically me kind of um, not seeing hands raised. Um, so what I think I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn my participant bar on. Um, and for board members, uh, use the raise hand function too, and now I can see it because I think a couple of people had their hand up and I was not able to see it. I think there might be a better technological solution I can work out with Anna, but for now I think that works best and I will just kind of call in order um, as the hand raise function. I know that's a little clunky, but I think it's the best we can do virtually. Uh, another thing I want to note is, um, you know, with a new board, I think we need uh, a retreat and also might be good to kind of just discuss kind of board culture, et cetera. Um, uh, I'm working with Libby and going to be working with the VSBA to get at least um, one training session on that. Uh, I also welcome uh, other suggestions on speakers on board culture. I've talked to Amanda and, and um, a couple others about that. Um, so it's a process that I'd like to get going kind of over the next few months and also probably a good subject for our retreat. And I'll work with Anna um, to get uh, some dates that might work for a retreat. I'm guessing we'll probably still be virtual. Um, so um, so we'll, we'll think about some ways to do that once we get some, some date options. Um, we may be able to do it, you know, safely in person with masks, which is how we did it last spring, uh, or it might just want to split into a couple of Zoom sessions. But um, let's look for dates for that after the budget process um, and kind of in spring. Uh, and we may want to wait until after March, just because we have, what, three or four seats up, just to make sure that we have, um, you know, a full board. Uh, together and then we can definitely discuss things um I mean, we can discuss them throughout but things like like board culture etc um and then the other thing is um we're talking about the budget uh we have 20 minutes of the beginning scheduled for public comment i'd like to cut that down to five and then add a 10 to 15 minute um uh session for for public comment after the budget presentation, which is our first item after the consent agenda, because uh, my thought is most people who probably want to comment want to comment on the budget. Um, Grant is going to show some changes on the budget, which might um, inform people um, and answer some questions beforehand. So uh, why don't we do five minutes of public comment at the beginning? Um, and for those wanting to comment on the budget, we're going to have a public comment after the budget presentation uh, where you can um, uh, make comments with, with kind of the new information in mind. Um, so uh, let me know if anyone on the board thinks that doesn't make sense. Otherwise, we can, we can do that. All right, excellent. Uh, so the first item is public comment. Again, we are going to have public comment on the budget after the budget presentation. So um, yeah, you're welcome to speak on anything, but if you want to speak on the budget, you might want to hold until after that presentation is, is over. So um, uh, the way we do this is um, if you hit the participant uh, list uh, on the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a pop-up um, sidebar that gives you a raise hand function. If you hit that, um, I can see it. If if you're not able to find that, um, just go ahead and, and raise your hand um, physically, and I can see it in the screen. Okay, I see Tina. Um, okay, uh, it looks like just Tina. So Tina, go ahead. Hey, um, I I have a conflict today, so I can't stay for the whole meeting. So I thought I would speak up now about the budget. And I was at your last meeting in which you were reviewing the budget presented by the administration, which was a 2.8% increase, definitely a reasonable increase for a school budget. But then Grant did a presentation explaining that given the CLA and the lack of revenue in the state, 
all of a sudden taxpayers in Montpelier were asked to pay 10.2% more on, than they paid last year. What surprised me was that nobody said anything. So I understand you have a whole bunch of new board members and it's hard to jump into the budget, but the people that were there from before, the fact that nobody turned to Libby and said, gee, is there something we could put off for one year so that the people of Montpelier wouldn't have this tax burden um, got to me, I guess. And I understand that Grant is going to make a budget presentation tonight with some fun balance and some recalculations that's going to bring it down to a little over 8% maybe. And Grant, I thank you for that. Um, but I have to tell you, when you talk about the budget today, I wish you'd think about a few things. One is if you lost your job in March and you still don't have one, 8% is a lot of money. If you're a business downtown and your business is down 50% from last year, 8% is a lot of money. If you're a senior citizen like me, I didn't get an 8% increase in my social security. And last but not least, remember what Andrew reminded you of at the last board meeting, which is income sensitivity doesn't take care of all taxes for all people. So just think about that and thank you very much for listening to me and good luck with your discussion. Thank you, Tina. Um, uh, no one else on public comment. So uh, let's go to the consent agenda. Um, do I have hey, a motion? Jim, did you, do we need to take roll to open yeah. the meeting? That's oh, we do need to take roll. I keep I forgot that. Um, and, and while I have the, the mic, um, just yeah. that I, for some reason, when it's in, in my participants' view, doesn't allow me to do raise hand, but for me, it's under reactions. So if anybody has reactions on the bottom of their screen and wants to use the raise hand function, that's where I can find it. So that might be the case for other people. Right. Yeah, just is to, anyone having difficulty finding the raise hand function? Andrew found it. I, Jim, just really briefly, um, I just updated my Zoom and now everything's totally different. I can see people raising their hands now and where I used to be able to raise the hand, I can't, I, I raise the hand in the same place Mia raises her hand. So I think we are dealing with some, some different versions and different people using different operating systems. So it might be in a couple of different places. Okay. Um, so if anyone's having trouble raising hand, um, just, just let me know. Um, yeah, Zoom is, Zoom is tricky. Um, you can also just physically raise your hand. I mean, I, I, I can see all your, your squares as well too. Um, all right. And thanks for reminding me on roll. Um, etiquette. Present. Jerry. Here. Emma. Here. Mia. Here. Brian. Here. Amanda. Present. Andrew. Here. And Jill. Here. Sorry, I was late. Oh, no worries at all. Um, now under the consent agenda, I do have a motion to approve the consent agenda. And again, if you want to um, take something off the consent agenda and discuss it, um, you know, make that part of your your motion. No one. I'll I'll move the consent agenda. Okay. Thanks, Mia. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Thanks, Etiquette. Um, any discussion? No. Uh, Etiquette? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Emma? Aye. Mia? Aye. Brian? Aye. Amanda? Yes. Andrew? Aye. Jill? Aye. 
Great. Consent agenda passes. Um, and now we are on to uh, Grant and Libby and the budget, budget presentation. Um, so take it away for, is this our fourth time? I think we're going to do um, Mike and the library media specialist first. Okay, perfect. However you want to structure it. That works. Go for it. We're going to yep. put together a short presentation for the library media specialist position. And we have Mike coming in, who is the director of this area in our district. And we have the marvelous Sue Monami and Lauren Chabot with us as well um, to talk about uh, the vision for that position and going forward. We also have Ryan Harity here to answer any questions concerning Union Elementary, although Ryan's not part of the formal presentation, but he's happy to answer any questions as well. So Mike, Great. take it away. I'll share my screen. And um, just in terms of questions, why don't we have uh, Mike, Sue, and Lauren, and thank you all for coming. Um, uh, and thank you, Ryan, as well. Uh, why don't we have them do the presentation and then open it up to the board for questions, because I know there are questions about this before, and then we can go to um, your presentation, Libby and Grant, um, and then open it up for questions again. Uh, all right, thank you, and take it away. Uh, thanks everybody for having us here. We, we know you kind of have a busy night, uh, so we created a, a pretty short presentation. Um, some of you folks will remember the information from last year when we talked about Roxbury and the position there. Um, you can go ahead there, Olivia. So uh, to start, we have a lot of guiding structures that really guide this conversation. One is EQS, and Sue's going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but the other are the standards, just like any other area of curriculum that we're working on, we really build around those standards. And in this case, it's from ESD and the AASL. Um, the library media specialists in our districts have been talking about a crosswalk of those two for a while now, and we've really articulated some areas of focus for our district that have been exciting. Um, aligned with that, we have some needs that are coming apparent. Uh, we're going through a literacy audit right now as a district that has been very enlightening. And one of the big areas for us to focus on is informational text and informational writing and research and analysis and opinion and all of those components that really delve into that library media world in so many ways right now. Um, and then moving forward, we have to mush all those things together into a great kind of component that really speaks to all those needs and helps build capacity of our educators, as well as support our students in accessing the text and information. And that's where these amazing folks come in, um, the library media specialists. So I'll turn it over to Sue for the next slide, I think. Thanks, Mike, for that intro. You're a tough act to follow. Okay, um, so as Mike mentioned in the previous slide, the Vermont Education Quality Standards do uh, specify that schools should have a full-time library media specialist and sufficient staff for the program. And that is to support the literacy, information, and technology standards. Um, we also support a schedule that provides opportunities for the library media specialist to collaborate with teachers as information research skills are integrated into their curriculum and also provide students with the opportunities to, it's the line that librarians use, locate, evaluate, synthesize, and present information and ideas within the content areas using technology integration. Um, and what has also happened in recent years, if you take a look at the professional standards for the library media specialist and, ed and the educational technology specialist, every professional standard under the educational technology specialist endorsement is addressed in by one or more professional standards for the school librarian. And now I'll turn it over to Lauren. Oh, you're muted. Lauren. Yeah, we can't hear you. I was so excited to get started. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so we wanted to give you all um, a glimpse kind of into what this looks like in on a daily basis in a school, the role of the library media specialist. Um, so on any given day, we are um, 
doing any number of these roles, most often, more often than not, more than one. So certainly we are the librarian working on collection development, reader's advisory, and research assistance. But in addition to playing that role, we are also a teacher providing direct instruction as needed. We're an instructional partner with every teacher in the building. We are an instructional coach to every teacher in the building to provide um, those professional development opportunities for them to grow and be independent, a kind of train the trainer model. Um, the heart of our training is in this information world. So we are the experts in the building in the research process in digital literacy and information literacy. Um, and we are technology leaders. We are on the forefront of emerging technologies and how they can be effectively used in the classroom for teaching, learning, assessing, creating, collaborating, sharing, et cetera. Um, and last but not least, um, a traditional role of a librarian is to be an advocate for um, accessibility for everybody. So making sure every member of our community has access to the information and lear learning opportunities that work for them and that help them move forward as learners. And on our last side, we really just put together some resources and some articles uh, for folks to look at. A lot of these talk about the changing role of librarians um, in these times, and, and it's from across different schools and states. So there's some some not apples to oranges comparisons, but it gives you an idea of the conversation. There's also the Ed Quality Standards. Uh, a good one to look at is the University of Vermont School Library Media Specialist Sequence. The things that are expected of students within that program nowadays. Um, really connects with what Lauren just shared about a typical day for a library media specialist. Um, there's a couple other articles in there to check out as well. We didn't want to spend the whole night talking to you about this, so we just put together this short presentation and I think we're, we're ready for some questions if you have them. Uh, <clears throat> great questions for um, Susan, Michael, and um, Lauren. For Ryan too, he's here as well, if, if you have questions for Ryan. Mia? Yeah, thank you for that present. Um, as we, uh, uh, throughout the conversation at the last board meeting and ever since then, I, I think this has been um, kind of solidifying in my mind of what this looks like. And the, the, um, the thing that I've come to is that um, what is that this, this position in the schools is a resource for kids and the teachers in the, to access information in the way that information is now available in ways that it was not available when I was in elementary or middle school. And I think the the one thing that would help round out that picture for me is if anyone, and this might be this might be a question for Ryan or if it might be a question for Sue or Lauren, what does it look like when one of the students at Union Elementary with this new this the as the position is now being um, established there, what does it look like when they go to their and participate in their special? during at some point during their school week with this with these changes because i can picture what it looks like for a kid to walk into the union elementary school library and take a book off the shelf but I, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around like so what is the what is what are the students going to do ryan why don't you start with that and then maybe lauren you could follow it up with what the msms vision is not in covid world but in typical world yeah, no, absolutely. Mia, that's a really great question. And it's something that uh, Marita Fry and I talked about pretty extensively last week. And, you know, it's, it's a shift in the model that we've had in the past. So in the past, uh, those two positions were separate for special. So if you were in third or fourth grade, you had access to technology as a special. And if you were in kindergarten, first or second grade, uh, you didn't have access to technology um, during the specials rotation. And really that was because of uh, logistical challenges. Students only have special for five days a week. 
And so PE is twice. And so when you factor in art and music, that just leaves one more special for the week. So the shift really uh, is going to be around what the students are doing during the library time and during that technology integration time. And, you know, right now, I think we're still developing what that's going to look like. So that's going to take a lot of teacher participation and identifying what those critical skills and standards are that we want to see at each grade level. I know the skills that <clears throat> that are uh, when you talk to a kindergarten teacher and you ask them, you know, what would you like the students to be able to do as far as technology? That looks very different than what you'll see with a fourth grade student. And so we we really need some time. Uh, to develop exactly what those learning blocks are going to look like. And, you know, I anticipate that it's going to be a very collaborative process. And, um, you know, it's going to be slow and steady. And, you know, I, I know that's not a very detailed response for you. But, you know, for a kindergarten student, I would say that there are some very explicit skills that uh, Marita will be teaching those students throughout the year. Um, really basic things like how to get onto certain apps, how to navigate, uh, you know, a lot of digital citizenship curriculum. So how to stay safe on the internet, that will be a really big focus, especially for our younger students as they start having their first introductions to being online. And then, um, you know, we're not, we don't plan to take away, you know, students access to books and students access to library and great literature. That's still something that's going to be extremely important to us. And so really it's gonna be about balancing those two things throughout the year. Great. Other Lauren, questions? Lauren, you wanna follow up from MSMS? Because the high school's so different. <laughs> so, um, well, Ryan, I think you did a great job with the vision for what that can look like at Union. I think the library and tech world blend so, they're so intertwined now that I don't see um, there really being a division at the middle school. I mean, I, there's only one specials class, a special, like a real class that kids come to the, they come to the library, but it's, it's called tech tools and it's a blend of research, website evaluation, um, digital citizenship, all, you know, all of those skills in it. Um, they blend, like I said, they go hand in hand together. And then also um, I'm in the classroom working with teachers and kids are getting those skills in their classroom with their content teacher and me supporting as needed. And they're certainly coming to the library for literature as well and for book talks and you know coming to check out books and that's still happening a lot. Um, so I don't see them as being separate intertwined. Emma. I just want to thank you all for putting together that presentation for us and explaining what the vision is. I think um, anytime that the budget shows a cut of a position, um, I think it's important for the community to understand and, and be on board with that. And um, certainly what you presented tonight definitely helps me as a board member understand um, why we went in that direction. So thank you so much. And I know you're all incredibly busy. <laughs> and so to add anything to your plate at this, at this time, I feel bad, but it's um, very, very helpful. So much appreciated. Um, when Lauren, when you, uh, projected the slide of all the different things that a library media specialist your position does. That was one of my main concerns is just like, is there too much on the plate of these individual um, teachers? And certainly I, I want to just give you all props because I know at least at the middle school, I don't know about um, at the high school, but Lauren is also serving as a pod co-teacher this year. So she's doing her whole specials curriculum and trying to teach that asynchronously. And then also additionally in person, um, acting as a pod co-teacher. So I think our specials teacher deserve a huge round of applause this year, because it's um, amazing the amount of work that you're having to do. And the way that you've pivoted and adapted to the situation is really fantastic. Um, I also really appreciate the in-house PD model that you talked about. 
Um, so just training the teachers to incorporate technology into their curriculum. Um, yeah, I think it's more of a comment than a question. So thank you. Hey, Philip. Um, Jill. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to add my thanks. I have a middle schooler and I've been really blown away by um, the word savvy comes to mind in the best way possible as we're navigating this crazy world that we're living in and the crazy political atmosphere. I can't think of anything more important than digital literacy and um, the fact that it's blended into their school day with their other subjects makes it so I think it's incredibly effective and actually sort of a lasting skill set that that won't be unlearned. So I'm, as a witness to it, really blown away and impressed by what you folks are accomplishing at the middle school. Thank you. Uh, and Jerry. Thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Really exciting stuff. Um, just a point of clarification. Maybe this is for Libby. This was not a cut position was it my understanding is that it was a temporary position to begin with no it's a cut position the oh. person who had held the position retired very late in the year last year and so oh, okay. the person currently in the position um was hired not in a traditional hiring period okay thank you Alana? Yeah, so I I just had that question um, specifically for for UES. So Ryan and and for Sue and Lauren, do you see? So when we when we are envision envisioning a program like this that is so important, um, and I know that the, the confusion for me last in the last board meeting was about are we cutting this position? Um, and then we're basically splitting kind of like the role of the librarian um, and adding a person to help with the book circulation, right? And so is this, um, it's just trying to understand kind of like the plate that is being given to the librarian. And in terms of the integration piece of supporting the teachers as well as supporting the students. So that's kind of like the, the, the clarity I need to create. It's like for envisioning a model where we need that, we need to support our teachers with the technology piece that we want all of our students to have and that they need that support in addition to creating a model that's gonna support all of our students with a technology piece. So I guess my question is, um, do you, how, what is the, what is that load, load look like, um, when we're envisioning this new model at the current budget for next year? And, uh, I mean, and, and, uh, Michael can also, anybody can answer my question from those in the ground. Sue, do you want to talk to that? Cause you had a one of the, you had a significant load and we added the library position, the library system position last year. I think Lauren has been more used to that position, right, Lauren? Because that's been in there. The library system position has been at MSMS for a bit longer. Sue, how would you answer that question? Uh, well, one of the things I would say is that um, in addition to everything that Lauren was listed on that slide, um, there are a lot of clerical tasks that the librarian needs to take care of as well. Shelving books is a huge part. Um, processing books, new books as they come in. There's just a lot of that um, work that a library assistant can help with that frees up the professional educator to then work with the teachers and the students using that skill set. Um, and providing that professional development so that it's not always the library media specialist or a standalone teacher teaching every student in the school how to use certain programs, but in fact, we're there to help the teachers learn how to use these and support them. As Lauren said, she's there to provide support for the teacher who's also introducing them. Um, I would say 
really it's it's taking some of that time that is spent in a non-professional manner, the non-teaching manner, um, and allowing the teacher, the library assistant is doing that, and they and the librarian is free to do the teaching part of the job. Does that help? That was a lot of rambling. I'm sorry. Before Lauren add on. Yeah, I would also add on to that too, that it's a model that really grows. Um, the position at the middle school was the library media specialist was combined with the tech integration in 2009, actually. And over those years, um, the staff become more able to be independent and they have that thirst for knowledge and learn more on their own. And I now, we now have a staff at the middle school that is very tech savvy and they um, teach each other and they take on a lot of that load to help one another as well. And so, I mean, it's like what we want with our students. They're becoming independent learners and finding stuff on their own. And um, I just, I think it's a work in progress always, but if you build that culture of constantly wanting to learn and improve that, you know, the staff ends up supporting each other a lot. I, I would love to hear from Ryan too and Michael. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. The, o <clears throat> the only thing I was gonna add on to that, just speaking specifically about UES is that we have teachers that over the past year, um, have grown so much as far as their ability to navigate technology, just being forced into the digital world that we've all been forced into for remote teaching. We have seen a learning curve like no other. Uh, teachers that haven't been able to do things um, have just adjusted so quickly and are now teaching other people how to do things and sharing resources and ideas. And, you know, there's, there's really a lot of positive things happening with our staff. So I do feel good about that. The other thing that um, I want to give Mike Barry kudos on is the way that um, our district has been able to facilitate district-wide professional development. And Lauren um, and definitely uh, Susan at the high school, you know, both of them have been able to, you know, provide professional development for our teachers at district days that have been very beneficial. And the teachers have self-selected that based on whether or not they need it. And I think that type of, of professional development model, I think is is really effective. So those are just some things that we're doing that seem to be working well. And I, I was just gonna add an example that's happened recently um, where at the high school, they are working on units of study. And recently several teams, content teams, invited Sue to be a part of that work um, which in the past may not have been as an obvious uh, uh, connection. Um, and so like, like Lauren had said, the, the position evolves and the work evolves every year. You're, you're kind of doing different things. And I think it's exciting to see that curricular connection and the instructional connection coming to that resource um, that is Sue and that is Lauren. Um, and that we're doing so much curricular and instructional work right now that I can totally see that happening at UES as well. Um, to be able to build in the resources of the library into that work. Thank you. Jim, you're muted. Um, thanks again to everyone for, for coming. Uh, it was very, very helpful. Um, and it looks like Emma has another question. Just a quick one. Um, I didn't see the pres your presentation in the board packet. Can you get that to us? Thanks. Um, thanks again for coming. Uh, very, very helpful. And uh, now I think we're on to uh, Libby and Grant's um, presentation, which I think is our fourth vote is going to involve some um, changes to get the tax to address the tax rate concerns that Tina and others have raised. So um, go ahead, go for it. Okay, and I guess Libby will share the screen. Thank you, Susan and Lauren and Mike and Ryan.
And I'm, uh, I'm sure you'll be relieved to know that this budget presentation is, uh, is just a, an abbreviated presentation that cho shows changes. So it's more like 12 pages instead of 40. You're welcome. <laughs> so if you go to the next slide. Thank you. <laughs> so the changes there, the only expense change was to um, career center uh, tuition. So what happened was the uh, Central Vermont Career Center announced their tuition for next year, and it was surprisingly lower than what we anticipated. So our expenses went down about 11000 not a dramatic drop, but, it, you know, we'll take it. The uh, more dramatic change is uh, what we made to try to uh, uh, reduce the Montpelier tax rate. And so what we did was we had talked about increasing the fund balance by I think it was like 60,000 or something like that. We ended up increasing the fund balance revenue by 150,000, which um, is like nearly a penny and a half decrease on the tax rate. We also increased the dollar yield. We had talked about a smaller amount, but we increased the dollar yield by $100. So basically, instead of going with the uh, tax commissioner recommendation of a $235 decrease, we're going with the assumption that it's only gonna drop $135. And I think Andrew um, would also um, be able to provide some insight into whether that makes sense or not. And I think the, the Ed Fund and the economic picture for Vermont is looking better. So I don't think this is a high risk. So with those changes, we've reduced the tax rate by 3.2 cents. Um, it's still an 8.3% increase, but it's a lot lower than it was. It was sitting at 10.2. Next. So I'm not going to go into the details of the program expenses, but this is more for your reference in case you want to look at it later. The only number that changed is the career center tuition, which is circled. Um, I'm also going to give you the next slide, which is the revenue slide. That's got the details for, once again, just for your reference, there's two numbers circled here. Fund balance, instead of like a $10,000 increase, it's now $160,000 increase from year to year. And the Ed spending, of course, that number changed because that's the balancer. If you go to the next slide, this is where we'll spend a decent amount of time. This is the updated tax rate calculation chart. Um, you'll see now that the increase in education spending is only 2%. Um, it was sitting at 2.7 last time we spoke, but because of that increase in fund balance revenue, it dropped down to 2%. I will tell you that I, this is the lowest uh, increase that we've had since I've been here at least. Um, as a point of reference, in FY21, the increase in Ed spending was 4.7%. So um, it's a very, very reasonable increase. As Tina Muncy mentioned, it is a very reasonable, whenever, whenever you're talking about routine salary increases, stable or in, increasing enrollment, and a 10% health rate increase, um, it's very reasonable. Um, equalized pupils hasn't changed and likely won't change by much. It might be tweaked a little bit, but that's a pretty firm number as far as what we're being told. Um, we increased the property yield by $100, as I mentioned, and it still needs to be set by law ultimately. That won't happen until after town meeting day. So the estimate that we come up with is going to be as good as it, as it gets, and we'll see how it plays out but I don't think it's a, a huge risk. Um, as you may recall last year, we used a higher number than the tax commissioner's recommendation and uh, we ended up being very close. So I think it's reasonable. Um, Montpelier tax rate dropped 3.2 cents. Roxbury's dropped another 2.6. Um, and of Montpelier's tax rate increase, which is sitting now at 14.4 cents, 11.3 cents relates to factors, the following factors, equalized pupils, dollar yield, merger incentive, and CLA. The one thing I didn't mention was budget. So the vast majority of this increase is associated with factors that we don't control, unfortunately. Next, please. So this slide just is um, showing the updated tax rate impacts. And once again, two thirds of folks um, receive some kind of an income sensitivity. Uh, so the dollar amounts, specifically for Montpelier, those dollar amounts may be lower for most taxpayers. I recognize though that the percentage increase is still gonna be you know, 
around that 8%. But um, the dollar amount impact is going to be lower for most folks. And you'll see for Roxbury, those numbers are negatives. So there's actually a reduction uh, for Roxbury because the CLA went up dramatically instead of down as we expected. Next. And this is just an updated uh, residential tax rate um, history slide. Uh, the takeaway, I, I, I sound like a broken record, but we can't control the common level of appraisal. And without the CLA, Montpelier's tax rate increase is five cents over those five years, and really four years if you go year to year. So that's like 1.2 cents per year, or 0.8%, a very reasonable increase annually. Um, and obviously, if you're looking at Roxbury, even with the CLA factored in, Roxbury's tax rate is much lower than it was before the merger. And this is a new slide I just felt compelled to throw in there. It shows the disconnect between our education spending and the resulting tax rate, and this is Montpelier's tax rates, um, since the time of the merger. As you can see, FY19 had the highest increase in ed spending by far, and the tax rate actually decreased. You'll see in FY22, we have the lowest increase in ed spending by far, and the increase is 14.4 cents, a higher increase in the tax rate than ever, way higher than ever, and the increase in ed spending is way lower than ever. So this just shows you, you know, it's not just the budget, it's those other factors like CLA and dollar yield. Those are the two big ones. Next. So as I mentioned, with increasing enrollment and with routine, just routine salary increases and with the large health rate increases that we've been seeing from year to year, it would be extremely challenged to try to come in with a level, at level funded education spending amount. Doing so would require a decrease of almost $420,000. The only way we could get there, since nearly 75% of our budget is salaries and benefits, the only way to get there would be to make personnel reductions. So we would have to look at classroom teachers where we had the lowest class sizes. Um, we would look at eliminating that proposed intensive needs uh, teacher that we've been so excited about at, uh, at the elementary school. We'd also have to look at other reductions because you'd need to come up with about the equivalent of five teacher positions to get that. We could maybe not have that many reductions if we looked at facility projects and maybe deferring maintenance, but that's a dangerous and slippery slope. Um, bottom line is, even if we were to do this, which would have an impact on kids, the tax rate increase in Montpelier would still be double digit. Um, because once again, those primary tax rate, rate drivers are not the budget. They're those other things like CLA and dollar yield. And there's only a few more slides to go. The outlook slide, I didn't change anything here, but I think it's important for us to keep in mind some of those factors that we're gonna have to remember and keep in mind as we build not only this budget, but the next few years budgets. And we'll just go to the summary slide. So the total increase, the total budget increase is 2.8%, but that's not the important number. The important number is the increase in education spending because that's what factors into tax rates. Education spending increases 2%. Um, I talked about the residential tax rate uh, for Montpelier, it's still an 8.3% increase. Roxbury is a 4% decrease. Same budget, much different tax impl implications. Um, at least at 8.3%, we are below what the estimated average statewide increase is, which is at 9%. So at least we, you know, we've gotten below that bar. And then the final slide is just, you know, for questions. It mentions the only meeting that we have left now is the informational hearing, which is the day before the town meeting day, where we'll put all these slides back together. We'll go through the whole thing for the public. Um, right now, as you've been told, because of the legal requirements for timelines on. Um, uh, publicizing your warning. We need to approve the budget tonight. So this is the time for you to ask any kind of questions that you need to work your way through before you approve the budget. 
and the warning. So I'll turn it back over to you, Jim. I don't think I don't know if Libby has anything else to add. Libby. I do not. This is the grant show, so I'd say board discuss it up. Great. Um, so we'll have board discussion, and then uh, I'm not sure we have any members of the public still around. Um, uh, but if we do, we can, we can invite them. Uh, Jill. Sure. So um, I, for those of you who don't know, I work at the tax department in the property valuation and review division. So our team actually calculates the CLA for all the, all the um, various municipalities. So I feel it's really important to um, try to give the Cliff Notes version of what the CLA is trying to accomplish. I am so, I think the way that Grant has laid this out is exactly right. I think it's really important for us as a board and for the community to understand that the CLA has zero relationship to our education spending decisions. What the CLA is designed to do is basically make up for the fact that what our properties are listed at is not what they're going for on the open market. So what we do with the tax department is we do a three-year study analyzing all of the sales that have happened and we compare what properties went for in those sales to how they're listed in the grand list. And then that determines how far off the grand list is. And the grand list is actually the number on your actual property tax bill of what your property is valued at and being assessed at. And so the CLA is a factor designed to make up for that and apply that to the tax rate. Maybe I'm not helping, maybe I'm making it worse. So essentially Montpelier has not done a reappraisal since 2010. So my house here in Montpelier has not been reappraised since 2010. Based on the sales analysis, my property and a lot of properties in Montpelier are going up substantially in value. So whether you have your tax rate at this and a very you know close to 100% CLA, or your tax rate is this and your CLA is going up, you're essentially paying um, you, you'd essentially be paying the same amount because what it's supposed to be is representing the fair market value of, of our property and then taxing that value. And the reason this is so important and why we do it every year in the state is that we are a statewide education funding system. So this would be just Montpelier's problem or just Roxbury's problem if we were our own microcosm, but this is actually impacting every, every municipality in the state and the education fund for the state. So I just wanted to really try to try to help folks get to the understanding of what the CLA is without their eyes glazing over, that it is a real estate value factor that is calculated and applied to your tax rate to try to represent what your property should be assessed at. Does that help or does that just make it worse? Yeah, that was very, that was a very good explanation, Jill. I know there's a lot of confusion out there about, about how tax rates are calculated in general. It's, it's a Byzantine, um, the Byzantine system, and I think there's a lot of, of misunderstanding. So thank you. Um, you're yeah. hired, Jill, for every every budget season going forward, or forward, you're hired for the CLA explanation. And the idea behind it really is is to be fair, because if if Jill's house hasn't been reappraised in ten years, and mine just was, both of our houses might be worth a million, but I'm paying taxes on a million dollar house and she's only paying taxes on a $700,000 house. So her rate should be higher so that we're paying the same amount in taxes. So it's really to try to equalize that. Um, I have two, one is a follow-up to what Jill just said, sort of a, this is my way of wrapping my head around the broader picture. And then I have an, another question, which I'll hold, because it looks like many of these hands are probably to this issue. So I can, I'll just hold my other question. but. On the point of it being fair, is it also, and to the point of it being we are a statewide education fund, is it also so that the more afflu affluent communities in our state are not the only places where a um, high quality education happens? Is it also, does, does the CLA also account for that or is that something, is that more of the where the equalized people part comes in? Or does it not have anything to do with that? If that's to me, I would say that is part of it. That is not the only driver, but it is part of it for sure. And if Montpelier just didn't reappraise forever, but we could afford our low tax rate on our high property, high value properties, then to heck with everybody else. But we are all part of that one system. And so all the towns have to sort of be recalibrated to the closest possible fair market value and assess that way. And this is how they get there. 
And and I would add that because it's a statewide system, there is one factor that every district in the state is measured against, and that's that property yield. And the fact that all districts are measured against that one same number, then some you know, some communities are gonna pay a higher tax rate depending on their spending there, and some are gonna pay a lower, but at least it's the same factor that every district is, is held as a standard. Nia, you got a second question? Actually, can I just follow up since yeah, Nia has a I different delete... subject? Exactly. And I'm confused still. <laughs> So, um, I just kind of want to blame somebody. So, who can I blame with this CLE? <laughs> uh, and I am stuck with what you said that, um, like, our properties haven't been reappraised since 2010. So, it, is that – so, I'm, like, just trying to understand. So, then you just take the whole thing and, like, you kind of do the appraisal. Not you, but like the tax department then says, okay, well, that, that, I'm just like trying in lay terms. Uh, well, this house hasn't been appraised, but we know that this house is, it's, uh, cost this much. And that's how we're going to assess. Is that, I'm trying to understand that in, yeah. in my Jill, lay terms. Can I, can yeah. I add something? So, do you want me to keep answering? I'm happy to take a stab, but go for it, Andrew. Um, and I actually have a question for you too, Jill, but Amanda and Mia, this, this goes, to what you were both asking about on this, it this pertains to equity because it's the city or the municipality, a town, if you live in a town, that's responsible for the appraisals. And so if you have one town that is saying, okay, we're not going to reappraise for 15 years, and another town that reappraises once every three years, that town that reappraises once every three years is going to be harmed without the CLA. So the CLA is meant to provide equity, this is one of its purposes, is meant to provide equity from municipality to municipality so that this centralized education funding system can't be gained. Does that make sense? And, and the question I have for you, Jill, in addition to this is I regularly, I feel like I regularly get asked the question, and this year is a really good example, uh, the city of Montpelier, so first of all, our property taxes have the education tax, but there's also the municipal tax on our property tax bill. And the municipality, if the municipality, if their budget is going up 2%, do they have to adjust for the CLA? Do they, does the municipality, does the city of Montpelier have to adjust for this factor, Jill? No. <gasps> we can blame them. Right. Now you have me questioning myself. No, no, they don't. Yeah, so this is something, I, I bring this up because if the city, for example, is saying, okay, we're, we're going to really reel it in this year, our budget's only going up 2%, it's below the rate of inflation, that, that is true, but I, I'm, just, I'm just explaining that it's not always apples to oranges when we're talking to, to taxpayers about the types of decisions that we make, because there's so much that's outside of our control here. Um, and I, I just think it's an important, it's an important note to make. Thanks for that. Um, Andrew, is that your question? Yeah. And Mia, did you have a second question that, that didn't get answered? Okay, let's go back to Mia. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, when I read the warning, the warning, the number on the warning is, um, $17,166, but I think the number on the budget slide that has the totals grant is 17, sorry, 17,366. And I feel, and so I just want to make sure if we're voting on the warning, we're voting, I'm not, I want to, which, which number should it be? It, it should be both. I know it's confusing. Um, okay. You don't see that 17166 because I've factored in the capital fund as an expense as part of our budget, but the capital fund is technically a separate article. Oh, so if I okay. Calculate the spending per pupil in Article Three. It's without that 250. And gotcha. Out, and then in four, four it shows that it. capital fund in there. So that's okay. the 17336 that you've been seeing in my slides. So okay. It is, Thank you. It is correct, but a very good question. Okay. Thanks. I'm, I'm done um, here, 
Great, thanks, Mia. Uh, Jerry. Thanks. Um, I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time to ask, but we got asked about this from uh, um, someone in the public. Why is the per student cost in Roxbury so high compared to Montpelier? Is there, is there anything student, we can do about that? There's very few students, but we still need professionals. We still have requirements for professionals out there. So the class sizes are incredibly small. Um, however, we still need a th third, fourth grade teacher. We need a special educator. We need a um, Title I interventionist. You need a principal. You need an administrative assistant. You need IAs. You need similar resources, adult resources, or human resources, rather, to make sure the day goes smoothly and safely and kids learn. And there's a smaller amount of kids, a significantly smaller amount of kids. It's it's like the economy of scale question. You know, it's it's even if we group grades together, you're still not getting a class size as large as we have at our other schools because there's just not enough kids. The other thing that I would add to what Libby said is you still have the same cost of, of maintaining a building, of heating a building, whether you have 10 kids or 100 kids. So it's those fixed costs and the fact that you can't have a high class size, both of those things kind of play into it. Yeah, the building is owned though, right? Yes, I'm just talking about like maintaining, like if you have to repair a roof or you have it and heating it, um, yeah. that kind of thing. So um, just, I'm sorry, one more thing on that. I know we recently talked about energy um, efficiency and I know when we got our solar, the person said, oh, you should put solar on Roxbury School, it would be perfect. Would that be any way to save in the future at all? Uh, we just did. We just added oh, okay. the experience, right? Um, there were, I think there were like two or three electric meters that weren't associated with the solar farm. We have just added so that every one of our electric meters is linked to solar. So we do get credits for all and that reduces our electric bill. Um, and then another thing that um, just kind of associated with that, the second quarter report that you just approved, you'll see on the fund balance that we've added a few things for one-time expenses that we want to do. And one of the things that's on there that you'll see now is the whole idea about heat pumps. We need to, we have mm -hmm. an, enough that we've kind of placeholded against the fund balance to do that. We just need to make sure that the engineering makes sense, that it's, that it's going to work well within all the rooms at Roxbury. So we are trying to move forward with those energy efficiencies. And in some cases, we already have moved forward with some of those. So yeah, we're, we're continuing to try to do what we can, but it's it's really the, the fact that it's there's so few students that makes yeah. it hard yeah. with few students. It means cost per pupil is higher. Okay, thank you. Emma? Um, yeah, I'll just comment quickly on the, the Roxbury per pupil thing too, is that I just don't think it's a fair comparison to compare Roxbury to Union Elementary School, which is a much bigger school or Main Street Middle School, as um, we, we got an email from a member of the public doing exactly that. And I think it's more fair for them to look at other schools that are of similar size if they want to get a clearer picture of where we're at per pupil spending. You know, it's a small community school which holds a lot of value. And, um, you know, there's a lot of similar size schools around Vermont and we could take a look at what their per pupil spending is and that would be a more fair comparison. Um, a couple of questions. Um, the, you know, when you talked about the potential, you know, in order to cut, to get to a level funded, uh, level funded budget and you talked about it, uh, cutting the intensive needs position. Is that the autism program position that we were talking about? Yes. Okay. And didn't we, didn't we discuss that in fact, that position, even though there is an expense in our budget, it, it can ultimately save us money? Yes. The idea is hopefully it will lead in less outside placements so that we can keep the kids in the school. So yeah, I'm not advocating for that. It's yeah. one of those things that it's like, uh, you know, um, biting off your nose to spite your face. It's something that would harm us and deferred maintenance is the same thing. It would save us 
one year, but it would bite us later. Yeah, I think um, I think that's exactly right. That's a, that's how I see it, and I'm not interested in those types of cuts. I think um, you know I this is an incredibly frustrating position to be in, and you and Libby and the whole admin team have done an amazing job putting together a really responsible, if not conservative, budget. And then it's so frustrating to have so many of these factors out of our control that end up resulting in um, this frustration from community members that the increase is going to be so high. And it just, um, you know, it's just one of those frustrating years. And I think, you know, maybe the answer lies more at the state level than the city level of, you know, the school board level. You know, maybe we need to look at the way we (laughs) fund schools and look at the model that we're using and lobby the state to change the model rather than school boards. Um, So another question, and I'm not sure if this is like a grant, Libby or Andrew or Jill, (laughs) anyone chime in, but um, I was interested in Tina's comments. I think she's very thoughtful and intelligent. And um, she talked about, you know, that income sensitivity doesn't take care of everybody. And I want to know sort of who are the people that fall through the cracks. I think, Grant, you had said something like two-thirds of Montpelier residents qualify for, I'm not sure if you're referring to the Homestead Act or what um, income sensitivity is provided for the school budget and the tax increase, but um, could you speak to sort of what what part portion of the population are falling through the cracks in terms of what threshold will people not qualify for that? Yeah, I'll start, but I have a feeling Andrew could probably jump in and give more more insight than me. But I think the rule of thumb is if if the household income is around ninety thousand or so, if you're above that, then you get no income sensitivity at all. If you're below that, you start to get it, and it's graduated. The lower the household income is, the higher the income sensitivity is. Um, but when I talk about, um, and I think Andrew made this point. So when I say the the impact for $100,000 in Montpelier is $144 more than than last year, it might not be $144 because people get income sensitivity, but they also got that income sensitivity last year. So their percentage increase on their tax bill is still going to be pretty much the same as everybody else, around 8%. So that's why, you know, the dollar impact on that chart may be a little lower, but the impact that they feel percentage-wise might be the same. Um, but to answer your question, the only people to, who don't get any income sensitivity at all are those households that are making over $90,000 or maybe a hundred thousand now. Um, but Andrew, do you have other thoughts to throw in? Yeah. So the, it, in 2020, it was, um, under about $140,000 of household income qualified for income sensitivity that might be changing. Jill, I don't know if you have any insights into that. This is a perennial issue and feel free to unmute yourself and chime in um, on those thresholds because I think they are going to be changing a little bit. But um, in general, households earning less than $47,000 are pretty well covered, though there is a maximum property tax adjustment of $5,600. And... um, so, you know, if you had a household earning less than 47000 that lived in a really high value property, uh, you know, they wouldn't be totally covered because there is a maximum uh, level of income sensitivity. But the general point, and, and I think this is a really good question, and I haven't analyzed it for Montpelier, and I actually think as part of our retreat this summer, it would be great to have either Jake Feldman from the tax department, who's a Montpelier resident, or Chloe Wexler, who is at the Joint Fiscal Office. They're the two of the state's leading experts on this. They calculate the tax rates um, or play play a critical role in calculating the tax rates with Jill's team. Um, I I think having somebody like that come in and show us like, hey, a household earning $60,000 a year, this is what it would mean for them, this kind of increase. But in general, the way that it works is the percentage increase for property taxpayers is going to be the same percentage increase for income taxpayers. So although income income sensitized, they're really paying on essentially an income tax, um, 
although they are paying a lesser amount in tax than those property owners who make more than $140,000 a year in in income are, uh, the percentage increase in their tax bill is, is, I I think it's supposed to be exactly the same. That's essentially how it reads in statute, but it might be approximately the same. So essentially, if you had a 10% increase uh, to a family that had an education property tax bill of $4,000 on their uh, $200,000 home, they would see an increase of $400. If you had their next door neighbor who earns, they have a household income of $100,000, same value house, they're paying uh, $3,000 in property taxes. This is a hypothetical. Their property tax bill would go up $300 instead of $400. So the percentage increase should be the same, especially between $47,000 and $140,000, as it is for those that are paying just on property above $140,000. And just a point of clarification is, um, does fixed income like Social Security count? So as part of your income sensitivity filing? It's based on the Homestead Declaration form that you file with your personal income taxes. And the point that um, the, the point that Tina made is actually a good one in that it's based on your last year's income. So you could have a family that was doing really well in 2019 that lost some serious income in 2020 uh, that they they aren't receiving any kind of income sensitivity. Um, And and that that was a point that, um, yeah, that it it was a good point because you pay based on your previous year's income. Um, I know Mia's resigned, but I want to ask kind of a follow-up question to that. How does property tax affect renters? Because I think it's an equity question. Um, for people who, you know, for the, my guess is the, the person responsible for the property tax is the landlord. And what measures his or her or it, if it's an entity's income, and does that get passed to, does that oftentimes get passed to renters in the form of rent increases? And is that in some ways regressive? Sorry if I just opened a can of worms. I don't think you opened a can of worms. I'm going to try to answer it because I like to be corrected by Andrew and Jill. Uh, <laughs> if it's a rental property, then that would be a res- um, a non-residential tax rate that would be applied to that property. The landlord would be paying that. And then, yeah, I assume that if, if I'm a landlord, I'm factoring that into whenever I set my my rent. But the thing to remember about um, non-residential tax rates are they are not impacted by our local budget at all. It's a statewide um, rate that's divided by the CLA, period. So um, we don't even really, in the presentations, we don't even talk about non-residential because it's not impacted by our budget, period. Okay. Thumbs up from Andrew. Um, I can I can decide quickly for folks who are income sensitized and they're renters. There's a renter rebate program that they can actually submit to the tax department, and it's based on a per county basis of what rents are. So there is sort of that additional aid, if you will, for folks who are needing income sensitivity that they can actually apply to get part of their rent reimbursed under the under the theory and probable likelihood that the landlord has passed that the property taxes on to their renters. And I, I should add, I feel like the the tax department, Scott administration, and legislature, Ways and Means, really deserve some kudos for updating the renter rebate program last year to eliminate what used to be just a massive cliff for lower middle and middle income families that rent or individuals who rent. So, great, uh, Mia. Uh, one was the um, a comment I forgot about earlier. So, I, um, uh, regarding increasing the amount of the fund balance from what you had originally planned, Grant, to use to um, to where it is now, uh, I just wanted to say I 
I support that wholeheartedly because to me, it doesn't make any sense for the district to be sitting on a very large savings account essentially when it, 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 and have that result in a, uh, a significant tax rate. So I just wanted to voice my approval for that. And then when um, Jerry mentioned the um, uh, question about the per pupil spending in Roxbury, um, I just wanted to, uh, Emma, your point um, of comparing the Roxbury school to other schools of its size, I think is a really good one. And we should probably do that in a very, in a real way outside of the budget conversation as part of just more long-term planning for our district. Um, I, I think that would be a real, it feels like a really important conversation to start because um, I do appreciate the point you made. And I do think it is a valid point that members of the public are raising about just when we think about the large pot of money and resources that we have, what are the most efficient and effective ways for us to be spending that that pool of resources to get um, quality education for kids. So I would, outside of, obviously there's nothing that we're going to do in this budget um, regarding that, but I think it's uh, good to start that conversation and, and have it be a real process and a real conversation that the community has about how to use those resources. I just, before we get to the next question, I just wanted to also address the fund balance because there might be some people that say, well, you're still only using 400,000 of fund balance for revenue. We gotta be real careful with how we manage fund balance because say we put a million dollars of fund balance in this year and next year we don't have any at all, that drop of revenue of a million dollars is exactly the same as increasing your expenses by a million dollars. So the reason why we're stopping at 400 is because we're gonna have to manage kind of a downward slope, a gradual downward slope of that each year so that the tax rate doesn't spike up. So, you know, I'm thinking 400,000 this year, maybe 400,000 the next year, then when, when we don't have to worry about um, absorbing that two cent loss in merger incentive, maybe we can drop it down a little bit more. Um, and, you know, we need to have something in case Libby and I have talked about special ed funding formula. You know, we could lose special ed revenues dramatically in one year. Um, the equalized pupil um, waiting study could make us lose pupils. And those things could dramatically increase our tax rate. So we need to, to have a, enough money that we can gradually drop that down each year. So I'm comfortable with 400000 I think that still leaves us with enough to be able to manage it. But that's kind of why we're not doing all of it in one year, because, yeah, everybody would love it this year, but oof, they would hate it next year. Uh, Amanda. Yeah, I, I mean, and I and I also think it's important to think of the context that we're in and, you know, COVID and how that relates to people losing their jobs this year. I haven't seen the unemployment, how many people lost jobs in in Montpelier but you know that's something that we should you know just like that has me thinking a lot um, about you know how all of the work that we're doing and what how contextualizing the realities of our communities right like and uh, how you know I know a few people who's uh, second person lost their job and they haven't been able to recover it and a lot of their savings are going. So like, how does that, you know, just like thinking about that. I also find our information a little bit inaccessible for someone like me, for someone like the public when we're talking about CLAs and, and, and I'm just wondering um, for March 1st, what kind of job we can do around like accessibility um, and like how to talk about this in like the latest terms. And um, and so like I'm envisioning something like, here are the factors that are out of our control and boom, 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 explaining that, that could really inform the people in our community about how like all these budget processes go and, and how they, they relate. Um, and then what else did I have? Yeah. So I think that that's where I'm going. It's just like the accessibility. Uh, someone who's new to the board, it's like my third time, um, and you know, like trying to understand all of it. And I am pretty, you know, I, I I like numbers. I'm a bookkeeper, and I know budgets and things. But you know, this is is this huge. So just like thinking about how we do this process um, and how to how do we engage this part of the work, 
And and so yes, like I, I wouldn't want to see any cuts around like the, those dreams of having support for um, kids with with um, autism or 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 that. Um, but yeah, like I, I also think that it, the the fund balance, like we also need to think about the context of the reality that we're in right now. That people lose their jobs, that COVID, that um, and this what the state is trying to do. So that that's what I have. And I would love to hear from Aniket and Ryan. You guys are quiet. Um, regarding Andrew, I just want to say, kind of following up on on um, Lana's comment, that I think one thing we're going to do in this budget more than we've done in previous budgets is really explain um, what these numbers mean and where they're coming from. Um, and yeah, you know, there's ways to do that. We, you know, the the bridge and Times Argus are um, usually very friendly to publishing op eds or editorials. Uh, Andrew and I can can work with Libby and Grant to put that together uh, and get a good one out that really you know explains this in in language that people can understand. Uh, but also, I think it's important to. Um, you know, use social media and other things to explain it because uh, it's it's complicated. Uh, people don't understand why a small small budget increase. It's really you know, as, as Grant was saying earlier, this is by far the smallest budget increase since I've been on the board. Um, uh, can result in, in what looks like a very large tax increase. Uh, so explaining all those things is going to be. Uh, very important, um, and also explaining the importance of it. I mean, it's it's very true that people are hurting. This is a, a difficult time, uh, but you know the reality is is, is that to, to get the numbers much lower, um, you start to you know, erode into our ability, I think, to really provide a solid education, uh, and that you know in terms of building back from COVID. Uh, you know, the schools are our cornerstone of our community. So keeping our schools strong is, is very important. So I think we have to get all those messages out and, and also, you know, show show sensitivity to the fact that, that this is is a difficult number for for many of our, our constituents and, and community members. Um, Andrew. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, that I, I was just writing as as the other board members were were talking speaking to different issues. I was just taking some notes and I just I just want to I just want to echo what you said there, Jim. It is going to be really important for us to communicate this clearly. And I want to empathize with Amanda because even people who work really closely with these issues um, find this, uh, find our property tax system and our education funding system to be um, very complex. And it, it's, it's a known problem with our ed education funding structure. Um, and I think there's a lot of different perspectives surrounding how to fund education in the state. But one thing I think all parties can agree on is that the current system is overly complex and leads to the exact types of issues that you were flagging. Uh, so we should try our very best to break this out and explain it clearly. But even with all of those parts broken out, it's, it's, it's partially a problem, an underlying problem with, with the system itself is that it's extremely, extremely complex. Um, and it puts us in a difficult situation as, as Grant, I, that graph you put together, Grant, I thought was really uh, helpful. That showed even, you know, we had large, the years that we had some of the largest um, budget increases, we actually had some of the lowest tax rate increases. So that disconnection is something that, um, is 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 really difficult to piece together. Mia, your point on Roxbury, I I I wholeheartedly agree with with that approach. And just a, a little context, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but I think it's helpful for the whole board to be aware of this. I know those who were on the board last summer are aware of this, but at our retreat last summer, we talked about this exact problem and how we needed to take a more strategic approach. But in light of the changing uh, guidelines and, and just 
situation surrounding the pandemic, as well as everything going on around um, social justice issues, the SRO position, police and safety around our schools, all of those issues really became front and center priorities uh, for us. And that is something that we have let kind of fall by the wayside, this rocks, this Roxbury issue. And it really is, I, I shouldn't say it's an issue, it's really an opportunity because we do have this building that's in amazing shape uh, and an amazing community there. And, you know, Grant's right, we don't have economies of scale in that building, which is why the cost is, is so high there, but it also presents other opportunities for programming that we've talked about in the past. And we just, we have not taken a strategic approach um, or done much in the way of community visioning surround, surrounding that issue to figure out how can we make better use of that school and um, of that building and are the are these costs that we can better control in the long run by by getting better value out of them. Um, the fund balance issue, I just want to let everybody know in our the the second quarter finance report, which should be in everybody's packet, there is a breakout of how we're planning to use that fund balance over the next three, four years. And it's been a point of conversation since I've been on the board um, and on the finance committee about how to use that. And um, right now, I think I think we've put together a very strategic approach and I gotta give Grant a lot of kudos for that. So um, we, Grant, Libby, and I had a conversation earlier this week about what is the most amount of, what is, how much fund balance can we responsibly use this year considering uh, future budget pressures as well as one-time expenses that we'd like to pay for out of that fund. And so you can see that and the public can see that very clearly in, in that report. Um, and, you know, lastly, I, I just, I just want to say, you know, I think, I think the administration has put together a really, really solid budget here. Uh, we, we spoke on Monday, Libby, Grant and I about, you know, what, the district's needs and um, you know what they've what they've put before us is is something that really provides for our students and our community and our community's needs and so so the goal was to figure out well how can we reduce this tax rate with without compromising those needs without compromising the quality of this really central institution um, and central service for for kids for families and so i i do support this budget but i think we're gonna have to really explain to people why there is such a large tax increase considering the prudent approach that we've actually taken to budgeting who can we blame You're muted, Jim. I I lost my internet. I'm back on, but using data, so I, um, I I I can only see the part. Okay, I can see the participant list now. Um, sorry about that, but it's all I can see. I need to see you or the participants list. Um, <laughs> Do we have, it doesn't look like we have any more hands raised. Is that there accurate? No, there are no hand raised. Uh, if you want me to help you with the hand raising, Jim, I can help you, but I, there's nobody with their hand, digital hand raised. Okay. Um, I also think, please let me know if this is correct. We don't have any members of the public on now, do we? No, we do not. Okay. Um, so I think our next, uh, our next order of business is to vote on the on the budget and the warning. Um, do we feel ready for that? Yes. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the budget and warning as presented? I move to approve the budget and warning as presented. Uh, do I have a second? I second. 
Um, any discussion? No. Uh, okay. Um, Wait, I, I have a discussion. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes. I, I just need to. So, like, I for me, it's really, really important that we do some accessibility, you know, stuff that, like, that how we inform the public. Um, so, is that part of this vote, like, or is that a separate thing? Like, like I, I want to vote, and I want to say that we need to make this accessible to our community. So, how do I do that? Where do I do that? Um, I do think. I I think you just make the comment. I don't know if that's something we actually vote on. And I think that's just something we we kind of commit as a board to do, um, in terms of you know working with the administration to put together talking points, to get out op eds, to put information on the website that explains the budget. Um, I don't think we need to vote for that. I think we do just have um, kind of a, a consensus agreement that that's what we're we're going to work towards. Are we doing like a senior center? I mean, usually, Amanda, there's there are certain engagements that happen. So I don't know. We'll have to discuss which engagements happen. Sometimes we do a separate one for Roxbury. Sometimes Tina helps do one for the Senior Center. And uh, I think most recently there was a town hall. So maybe that's a separate thing we can talk about. Yeah. And, and we can also make that just an ongoing agenda item because we have, you know, two meetings between now and town meeting day. So we can just discuss on, on the 3rd and what is it, the, the 20th of February, where we're at with outreach and accessibility um, and just kind of make sure that we're, we're following up on that and, you know, doing, uh, doing both, uh, things in terms of disseminating information uh, with op-eds, with website info, with social media, et cetera. But then also I think it's important, as Jerry just mentioned, to make sure we reach out to places like the Senior Center um, and some other places that might be able to to get um, to get a, a large Zoom or other meeting uh, where we could explain to various constituencies um, you know, what, what this is all about. Thanks. Jim, I, to, to add to that, um, and Amanda, based on what you were saying, I feel like we should come next time with some action items in mind. It seems like you have some action items in mind already, Amanda. Jim and I had talked about uh, getting together and writing an op-ed that explains ex exactly what you said should be explained better and, and clearer and, um, or just, explained clearly, I shouldn't say better or clearer, but, um, and so I think at the next meeting, it would be helpful if everybody considered, you know, what are some action items that, that we could do as a board? And we, we need to be careful because we can't meet all of us together outside and we can't have a quorum, but maybe we could break into pairs. For example, Jim and I will work on an op-ed. It might make sense at our next board meeting to think about breaking into pairs in terms of uh, outreach and communication on issues in the past like what Jerry was saying, would have one person reach out to organization A and another person reach out to organization B. Yeah, yeah and, and living ground, I hate to put more on your plate, but if you could put together, and I think you've done this to some extent already, uh, maybe distill some high level talking points um, about, about the budget and what the numbers mean. I don't think it has to be much, just um, you know, some, some bullets that, kind of have top line messaging on them and, and also are supported with, with some of the you know, main numbers and what they mean. Can I suggest something just to help with sure. that? So to, maybe what we can do is send some questions that can then be explained. Yeah. Like I like out of all the presentation I have, like a lot of things. So it's like, well, what are the factors that are of control and why? And, you know, like what, you know, what is um, how, what does this mean for renters? What does this mean for like? I think it will be really helpful. So like maybe I can. I have a bunch of questions I can send. Like if you have others, we can send to Brand, and then that could be some of those uh, answers <laughs> from you that knows the number. Yep. No, that would be great. Um. 
Uh, any other uh, discussion points? Can you see the participants list anymore, Jim? Uh, no, I, I can uh, I, I I can call it up for a roll call, but um, okay, I, I have my hand up and, yeah, and Jill okay. does. Yeah, okay. I was just going to offer that um, when we're putting together anything that is like a material or an or a externally facing um, asset, I don't know, document, whatever, that it. Um, maybe we should have some of the newer board members get their eyes on it before it goes to the public because we are the ones who are probably closest to a member of the public than like Andrew and Jim who have done this a number of times and whose um, language around it is a little bit more like, um, like for somebody who's done it a number of times. Whereas those of us who are brand new at it might be able to offer like a way of saying, well, this still doesn't feel super clear to me and therefore it might not, it still might not feel super clear. So I just would offer that. And and as a new member of the board, I am offering my services to do that as you are drafting. Great. This. Great. Thank you, Mia. And Jill. I was just going to follow up to um, Amanda's question that Libby and Grant, I'm happy to help answer those questions if there are like Q and A questions, if that's helpful. Um, and also I know that like the tax department and agency of ed have created some of those sort of trying to get that, you know, big picture look for folks. So rather than you guys spend a whole lot of time creating stuff from scratch, if you want, if, if Amanda, if you want to send those CC me when you send those to those two, I'm happy to try to help answer some of those just to take some of the, the load off. Great. And um, if it's okay, I don't want to create a board discussion. Um, why don't you not CC me if you're going to CC Jill, and then Libby can maybe just forward them to me so I'm aware of them, but so we don't get a, just in case we start asking questions and get into a heavy territory. All right, not seeing other hands. Uh, I think we're ready for a vote. Uh, etiquette. Aye. Amanda. Yes. Uh, uh, the thing is shifting on me. Jerry. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Andrew. Andrew. Aye. The, could you not hear me? Aye. Oh, yeah, I can hear you now. Joe. Okay. So. Aye. Ryan. Aye again. Oh, sorry. The 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 names are moving. Uh, Mia. Aye. Uh, anyone who did not vote. Aye. <laughs> was that Emma? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Annika, did I get you? Yes. Okay. I am. Okay. Um, I think I've got everyone. Uh, all right. Excellent. Well, uh, we have a past FY22 budget, and as has been noted by several people, um, I think we need, uh, obviously we need to do a lot of work in the next, between now and, and town meeting data, effectively communicate um, what this budget means and uh, um, yeah, what it, what it means for our schools, what it means for our community. Congratulations, everyone. And thank you again to Grant and Libby for all that. Yes. Yeah. Walking us thank you. This is the face that people are going to make, right? I just put it on my. That's the face people are going to make. <laughs> For a high quality yeah. education, that's the face yeah. they're going to make. High quality <laughs> education. Well, yeah, we, we've always had a very supportive community that has understand the, understood the values of our schools. Um, and uh, I think if I think if we let them know that that this is a very a very responsible hold the line budget um, and that, you know, the numbers are out of our control. Um, hopefully uh, folks will step up and um, you know, we'll, we'll also explain to the extent we can how there's, um, you know, I think Tina's right that this will be hard for some people, but I also think that um, there is relief for some people as well too. And explaining that is important. Um, on to the next uh, thing, which is a an update on the board safety committee, uh, and I just for purposes of, of both time and efficiency, uh, we are going to have a much deeper dive on this. Uh, 
I believe, on the 3rd. Uh, and this is just meant for a quick quick update from Emma and Mia as well, if she wants to chime in. Uh, I know people have a lot of questions, but if you could um, hold your questions for the broader discussion, uh, that would be helpful in terms of moving through this agenda. And again, this is this is just meant to be a, a quick update, uh, but this will be a, a major focus of, I believe, the next meeting. So there will be plenty of time, I think, to have all the, the hard questions that, that we want answered, answered. Um, and I think I may be able to rejoin uh, Looks like my internet is back up, but um, why do that, Emma? Why don't you go ahead and and start? Yeah. So the plan was for me just to give you an update on where we're at and what our plan is for the February third board meeting, so that you kind of have a heads up of what to expect, and also have maybe some time if there are some specific questions or ideas that you would want the committee to bring to the table for the February third meeting that you would have time to sort of think about that and then get back to me via email. Um, the committee, the, the last committee meeting is on Tuesday, January 26th, the last meeting before our February 3rd board meeting where we will be discussing the SRO position. So if you, if there's something that you feel like you really want to hear from the committee or a specific question that you want answered, it'd be great for you to email that to me so that I have an idea of what you're looking for um, so that when we prepare for the February 3rd board meeting, we're, we keep those things in mind. Um, so I just want to say that it's really been an honor to serve on the committee. And as the chair, it's filled with thoughtful, intelligent, community-minded uh, members of, of our community. And I've been really impressed with the level of commitment that they've shown um, to the committee. We've been asking a lot of them. We've had um, 10 meetings, which just in the meetings alone represent 21 hours of work. And then we've been doing a lot of like breakout homework outside of the committee meetings. So individual members have been putting in many, many hours of their time on this topic. And I've just, I just want to express my appreciation for the dedication of all the committee members. Um, I also want to just give a quick shout out and thanks to um, Susan McCormick and Keisha Ram who helped us facilitate the first few meetings and uh, retired Chief of Police Tony Bacos and the, the current Chief of Police Brian Pete and Libby Bonesteel who came and did a, a nice presentation for all of us. And um, recently, Lara Merchant and Mary Zantara, who are local parents and community members, they put together, they're also um, UVM Masters candidates and they're working on collecting SRO data and they provided a presentation to the committee last night. Um, so our, our plan, and this was partially um, developed with, with the help of Sue and Keisha, the first part of the committee charge is to make a recommendation to the board on how to proceed with the um, school resource officer position. And sort of in, in the course of our work, we were realizing, you know, this may not end up being a binary sort of up and up or down recommendation from the whole committee. And our plan for February 3rd is to give you more of an overview of the work that we've done so far and some of the feedback that we've received. We've done, um, like I said, we've done a ton of work. We did a, a pretty vast stakeholder survey that included um, a variety of stakeholder groups and we got um, over 450 responses to that survey and we've sort of collated it and themed it and uh, um, synthesized it. And then we've also, we also did a Q and a, uh, a, a Q and a process where the committee came up with a whole bunch of questions around the SRO position. And then we did breakout work, um, and conducted many interviews, dozens of interviews outside of the committee to answer a lot of the questions that we had around the SRO and that some of those questions were answered by Libby or the police department or other schools, um, experts in the field, organizations, community members, students. Um, so we're gonna present all of that work to you and sort of show you what our findings are and then boil it down to some common themes um, and core values around public safety in our schools. 
And then we do have a document that we're working on right now that's sort of the, um, the benefits of keeping the SRO position and the benefits of eliminating the SRO position and then, and then sort of some other high, higher level um, points that we want to make sure that the school board hears. Um, so, so that's our plan. Our plan is not to come to you and say, do this or do that. We understand that the committee is not a decision-making body and that the school board is ultimately um, the body that will make a decision up or down on the SRO. Um, so our plan is to just present you with everything that we've done so far and then give you um, some of the things to keep in mind in terms of you know, the benefits of your decision one way or the other. So I wanted to sort of lay that out to you. Um, and then if you have any questions now that you want me to quickly answer, or if Mia has anything to add, and then also between now and next Tuesday, if there if something is rising to the surface for you, like Emma, I would really like the committee um, to report on this specific question that I have around the SRO, then we can make sure to incorporate that in our presentation for February 3rd. Mia, do you have anything to add? So I see the, the Andrew hand. Andrew has a question, yeah. Um, you want me just to call? So I see um, Andrew has his hand raised, go ahead. So do you, and, and we've spoken about this a couple of times, um, do you anticipate, you're, you're gonna provide us with a bunch of information, which is gonna be really helpful, I'm sure. Do you anticipate that you're gonna identify action items for the board? Like this is a decision point, or here's a decision point or action items for the administration, like where, um, or just action items in general. I'm just thinking. Yeah, I think I think what you're asking is, is basically re, uh, revolves around the second part of our charge, which is to sort of create some recommendations around the vision moving forward. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, I think the committee will be eager to know are we, are we recommending a system with an SRO or without an SRO? And once we know what we're working with, then we'll be able to better create action items for the second part of our charge. Is that, does that answer your question? So, so this is really uh, here, we, we feel like we've completed the first part of our charge. Here's where we are. We still have the second part of our charge. Um, and and the, the first part is obviously going to be to keep the SRO or to not keep the SRO, correct? Correct. Yeah, that's how the charge was written. It was yep. sort of split into two parts. So the first part is to sort of explore the, the specific position of the SRO, and then the board will make a decision on that. And then the second part is to um, look at a vision for justice and equity and uh, in our schools as it relates to our diversity, equity, and inclusion policy. And so that could be with an SRO or without an SRO, but we're going to be examining that topic. Okay. And then I, and then I imagine some recommended action items. Thank you, that's helpful. Yeah. Uh, Ryan? Yeah, no, and we were kind of getting to my question there at the end, I'm just trying to remember the process that we laid out for the committee. The committee is expecting to do more work after this February 3rd briefing with the board, correct? It's gonna be fleshing out some of the themes that were deliberated and um, the committee is not dissolving after this February 3rd meeting, right? Correct. <laughs> We've been, we actually had an extension. So we had originally um, meant to finish the first part of our charge by the end of December. And then we sort of discussed with, with the board and with Jim um, and around the budget, uh, the budget question primarily, like when does this need to be answered? When does the board need to make a decision one way or the other? And because it really wasn't, um, it didn't have to happen by the end of December, we extended it. And then we're gonna be meeting at least through March on the second part of our charge. Okay. So I see um, Amanda has her hand up. Just a quick reminder to my brain that the, the there's no SRO on the next budget that we just voted on, correct? That's the correct. Budget. So if, I mean, hypothetically, I think what we talked about is if the board decided to keep the SRO position, then Grant talked about using fund balance money to pay for that position. Or, or similarly, if, or conversely, if the board uh, voted to not keep the SRO position, 
then there may be um, there may be things that we would want to put into the budget in uh, the absence of you know in place of the SRO to fill some of the role roles or responsibilities that the SRO previously had filled. And so there may may need fund balance money to cover some of those expenses. But that would be a decision that would come later after the budget process and would be, that was my understanding anyway. Maybe Jim can speak to that. Yep, that sounds right. Um, Anakit, yeah. Um, first of all, thanks for doing all this um, su superlative work on, on the committee. I appreciate all the hard work that, that's gone into it uh, for you guys and the uh, community members. And, Everybody who participated. Um, my question, um, I have a couple of simple questions. One is, next meeting, are we voting on uh, up or down SRO? Um, so the February 3rd meeting, is that is that what the vote's going to be? I think that's the plan as it stands right now. Okay. And and if I heard you correctly, there is not going to, the committee is not really coming out with a recommendation one way or the other. Committee is gonna present their findings and then board's gonna, all of us are gonna decide which way we wanna go. So, that, so there's not gonna be a recommendation one, one way or the other uh, from the committee uh, about the, the yes or no, right? Correct. Um, yeah, we, I guess what ended up happening was the facilitators felt like it wasn't because we weren't actually voting on the SRO one way or the other, we weren't. Um, we didn't feel like it was conducive to the work that we were doing at the first part of the charge, or more importantly, the second part of the charge, for people to sort of declare a position one way or the other um, as part of their committee work. So I think you know the hope is that we provide you with enough information where you are able to make a decision as an individual board member. Um, and then there is a possibility that individual committee members may end up writing a position statement to the board, um, but that would be up to the individual committee members. So the committee as a whole wouldn't be, okay, all right. Right, right. I don't see any other, um, Amanda, you still have your hand raised, but I'm not yeah. sure if you still have. It's an old hand, <laughs> like me. Yeah, feel free to email me between now and then. I mean, it would be great to hear your thoughts if you have specific ideas of what you would want to see in the presentation or uh, specific questions that you want answered. It would be great to have those before our next meeting on Tuesday, the 26th. Yeah, and I want to give a big thank you to Emma. She's been doing a ton of work on this. Um, uh, I know it's a I know it's a big job, and, and she's she's putting in a lot of hours. So so thank you, Emma, for all the, the great work. Um, and it really is like a team effort. I mean, the whole committee, every member of that committee, is putting in a lot of work. It's awesome. Nice. Uh, so next up, we have uh, superintendent evaluation, and I know the evaluation committee is not scheduled to meet till tomorrow. Um, so just want to go into. Uh, executive session and talk a little about kind of about process and what we might want to get out of out of this. Um, do we, Jim? Do we not have policy monitoring? Oh yeah, no, sorry, thank you. I I skipped over that. We do have policy monitoring. Let's decide what we want to do in superintendent evaluation since I I brought it up. Um, Libby, they have not seen a, a a ton yet, have they? And Jerry. My role was just to get it to the committee, so. Yeah. Yeah. And then we were going to meet Jim, and that's tomorrow, to Our decide meeting. how to facilitate it with the rest of the board yeah. and to it kind of review that. So I'm not sure that we meet now. I'm not sure how effective that would be. Um, it, it sounds like we might want to kick it to the, the third, even though the third is busy. Yeah, let's okay. us the committee meet first and then we'll do it. Okay, is everyone okay with that? Good, okay, excellent. Um, yes, and you are you are totally right, Mio. We do have uh, policy monitoring next. And do you have a, a question as well? Yeah, I just am, I know you can't 
say what exactly we're going to see, but can you give us an idea? Are we going to get like a summary of this was the superintendent, this is the superintendent's self-evaluation and then responses from the, uh, the others who filled out the evaluation? I'm just curious. Uh, we will we'll be digesting. The, Jerry, why don't you answer that? We'll at least see the form, right? Yeah, we will. So that document, I think I sent you a, a draft of it where um, we basically Libby does a self-evaluation and then we also look at each one of those categories and we add our comments to that as well. So I would just say after the committee meets tomorrow, we will probably send some kind of pre-read ahead um, for the meeting, the next meeting when we go into executive session. Um, and then we will at that time facilitate like a, a comment session. Yeah, it's, it's like a, it's a scored, um, yeah. it's a scored document. Um, so we'll be and, filling it out in that executive session on the third. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be okay. kind of as a group deciding on which comments should float to the top and which comments we should actually put into the document. Actually, the, the committee will be taking all the feedback from the different board members, and then we will kind of synthesize that into a cohesive document, which then you will get back to the board. They, they will say, yep, yeah, that sounds good, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, and then the, yeah, so we, and then after that, I'll meet with Libby uh, where Jerry and I will meet with Libby and kind of go through our responses. Uh, Emma. I just want to be mindful of that. I think I heard February 3rd meeting and I just want to be mindful of um, packing that because right. I know that the SRO conversation is bound to take up a lot of time and there's, I think there's probably going to be quite a bit of public comment. So I just want you to keep that in mind when you're planning that yeah. agenda. Yeah, I'll, I'll work out with Libby. We might be we might be able to do it the twentieth. Um, we don't want to kick it too far back. We also don't have contract renewal this year. So, um, Libby, let's discuss kind of when we get to crunch hour. Um, but but that's a good comment, Emma. And I was I was kind of thinking of that as well. This is not a process we want to shortchange either. Uh, Amanda. So just. We get to write afterwards. I'm, I'm just very confused about the process. Sorry, you guys uh, collect the information tomorrow, like in in your meeting tomorrow, and then it comes back. Or or did you guys already fill out? The no, we'll we'll okay. collect the superintendent evaluation committee will collect. Like Libby will do her own evaluation. We'll kind of look at it and we'll we'll think about it. We'll do some suggestions. Then we'll come in executive session, have the whole board give feedback. I see. Then the, the superintendent advisory committee will rewrite that document with that feedback in mind. Then it'll come back to the board. The uh, superintendent advisory committee will basically, you know, run that feedback by the board and say, is this what we agreed on? Um, and make any further changes based on that. And then we'll finalize it. The board will finalize it. The board will sign off on it. And then there'll be a meeting between, usually in the past, it's just been me and Libby, but uh, it could be me, Jerry, and Libby, where we'll sit down and we'll kind of go through and do uh, do a one on one evaluation. And, and I'll describe what the board's feedback is and, um, you know, kind of answer questions you might have about what the what the, the written board's feedback was, why we scored the way we did, et cetera. So Jim, I have one question. Um, yep. In terms of a pre-read, do, are we able to send, so Libby's already done her part. Are we, are, are we able to send that ahead to everyone on the board um, securely? because they'll want to read it before we go into executive session, even though we're facilitating, they'll yeah. still want to have a chance to read it. I think we've done that in the past, haven't we? Haven't yeah, you said like a password for brought, the document, Libby? We brought paper, paper copies, which 
I was really regretting this year because I had to retype every single thing because <laughs> I didn't have a digital copy. But now we have digital copies. There are ways to send it securely. I don't think we need to, you know, put it in the mail to everybody, but it's just something we need to decide on because everyone will want to read that ahead of time. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point because we don't have, I mean, we could do one of two things. We could either have Anna just mail out a hard copy to all the board members, or we could do some sort of password protected thing, whatever is easy. Yeah, the only problem is if people make comments and write it on the paper, that's going to create a, a bit of a nightmare yeah. to get it back into the document. So um, maybe I, I can follow up with um, Anna or somebody on how to do that secure. There are ways to send it securely. I mean, we can do it on the cloud drive. It's already on the cloud drive, right, Libby? Yeah. I mean, well, so and we don't access it there. Don't we have uh, open meeting law problems with the Google Doc? Oh, I don't. I don't think we can. I don't think we can edit a Google Doc. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I don't. It might be something different though, because this is personnel. So That's true. Yeah. That's true. Tied to executive session, Jerry. You might want to reach out to Susan Holson at the VSBA. She'll, she'll get, she'll figure, she'll find out for you. Okay. Can you send me that name? Uh, any other questions about superintendent evaluation? Great. Um, so policy monitoring. Um, So I'll open up to well, open up to a motion to approve policy monitoring, and then you know if we have any questions for Libby, we can. We have the the D fifteen health insurance portability and accountability, which is removed, and then the D sixteen proficiency based graduation requirements. Um, any any questions on those policy monitoring reports? And we can move to approve them. Uh, yeah. What what does removed mean? Is it that we're not no longer going to have this policy? Good question, Mia. I uh, I went to so we have a, mon a calendar for when we monitor policies, and the health insurance portability was up for this board meeting. And so when I went to go, um, I just went to go look at it, and there's a question I had inside of the policy monitor or the policy. And so often I'll go to a different district to look at what they have. Um, and so I went to Essex Westford's website and had removed on their website. So then I went to the VSBA model policy um, website and it had removed that policy as well. So I emailed the, the policy committee to see if they, they knew why and nobody really knew why, but we're guessing it's because it's, re it's referencing HIPAA. And that was my question. So it's, we're not a medical entity and so we don't have we're we're not we don't fall under hipaa but that's what the policy stated we were so our guess is is that we don't follow follow hipaa and so the policy no longer is correct by law that would be my guess and ryan zajac and i were talking about it i think ryan that was your same guess as well yeah and so i think in general maybe the that policy has been over applied. I mean, so there are, it sounds like some schools who actually do provide health care. Um, so in those situations, you know, HIPAA would apply to a school, which it normally doesn't. Um, in general, it sounds like FERPA kind of trumps HIPAA. So if something is an education record, HIPAA doesn't really apply anyway. Um, so I think in general, we probably don't need this on the books since we're not necessarily providing health care. But I am curious though, with the, the special needs unit that we're potentially gonna be implementing at UES, you know, would some of those students, would any of that classify as healthcare delivery, healthcare needs? No, no, it wouldn't be. It's still, and any student need is, is qualifies under FERPA. That's what we, we follow. And we have the adequate policy for FERPA. 
um, on the books. So HIPAA is strictly on medical records. And I, I believe this healthcare portability was all about the adults, not the kids. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's, that's all that I've picked up since you wouldn't raise the flag that, hey, this has been pulled across the state. What's going on? Um, yeah, so I would recommend that we follow the lead of the other districts and Anna just update the website and say removed next to it. Well, we would have to take board action um, to remove the policy. It would be like modifying the policy, I think. So we would probably have to, mumble with trust, what we would have to do is we'd have to have it as an action item on a board agenda to take it. Yeah, make that decision to remove it. So we have to like, do a reading? I think we could just put in the consent agenda as an action. Yes. The action would be right. the consent. Mm -hmm. So we can just remove it. We don't have to like undo it like we would have to enact it. Like the three readings? Yes. I don't think so. Another question for Susan Wilson. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah. Amanda? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that we should just make sure that we know like, I don't, I don't like, like, oh, other districts are doing it, we should do it, because other districts also do things we shouldn't be doing, so. Uh, it's on the VSA I, website as well, though. That's yeah, the, but if we don't have their confirmation, so I think that, you know, the policy committee, we were going to reach out to them, so I, I like to just, like, be clear, like, why, what is it removed, and how, like, what statute is this, is this doing, so, like, to say that, let's have a confirmation that why things are removed before we move forward to put in a consent agenda. So maybe I, I, I uh, you know, we can talk to about that in the policy committee and like make sure that we have rec uh, recommendations from BSBA, or like of why they're doing it. Because sometimes they don't need there. No. Yeah, Mia. Yeah. On our agenda for the twenty fifth. <laughs> oh, it is Ryan. Okay, great. Yeah, I was just thinking. It seems like and this is a good kind of learning process for me that it seems like this is the kind of thing that would come from the policy committee to say we we either need to update this policy or we don't need it anymore so if it's our it's on your agenda then great thank you policy committee yeah and that sounds like the right thing to do is to have the policy committee figure it out so glad we're doing that um is that a is that a stale hand amanda or, or is that a new all right um <laughs> Any further discussion? Uh, motion to approve the policy monitoring reports. So move. Uh, second. A second. Just any discussion? Any further discussion? Yeah. So just just to clarify, what we're approving here is the report of D sixteen. We're not approving. Well, I think Anything we're approving the reports. We're not necessarily reproving the the existence. I think it's two separate questions. I mean, there's the the monitoring report, and then there's but part of that report is that this policy has been removed. So we're going to have the policy committee follow up to see whether we still need it or not. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I didn't I see... got D sixteen though. There is only, only policy monitoring report. Yeah, there's only D16 there is a, for a report. I think. I didn't do a monitoring with the healthcare portability. Right. Yeah, so I just, just want to make sure that in our minutes it reflects that we are approving right, the report D16. of D16 because that's all we're approving. Yeah. yeah. That's all we have. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know yeah. if we need to amend amend that or not just uh let's, let's make the motion clear that we are just approving the d16 monitoring i um, i move that we approve the policy monitoring report for d16 proficiency based graduation um a second second further discussion um etiquette hi Anna, was, did you have a, saw your hand go up, okay. Um, Andrew. Yeah, yes, hi. Amanda. Yes. Jerry. Hi. Emma. Hi. Mia. Hi. Ryan. 
Aye. Jill. Aye. I think that's everyone. Um, <laughs> motion to adjourn. Can I, sorry, can I have one question? Like, where can I find the monitoring report? Or I'll ask, never mind, I'll ask Ryan. Yes. All the policies and stuff are on the website. You can... The monitoring of when you're supposed to, is there like a calendar? Oh, that's on the, web, that's, on the website too. It's on the okay. website. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anna, Anna needs us to, need you all to get your picture taken. <laughs> okay. Before you go anywhere. Thanks a lot, Anna. <laughs> She, I told um, her to snap pictures while you were talking, but then she was like, but then it will be like resting faces. <laughs> uh, didn't want to catch you off guard. <laughs> you need them taken now? Yeah, why don't you do it just before you? <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't want my picture taken <laughs> today. So if it's all right, I'll count to three and then take a screenshot. A couple, sure. maybe. Yeah. All right, ready? Yes. One, two, three. Okay. One, two, three. Oh. And a kit. <laughs> awesome. Thank you all. <laughs> That's perfect. Uh, Amanda, you can blame the city. They're the ones who requested it. <laughs> I'll blame um, the city for everything. Quick, <laughs> quick little funny story before we adjourn. Like usually they have a professional photographer come in and take this picture. Um, and about three or four years ago, Peter Sterling decided to give Michelle Braun bunny ears in one of like 50 shots the person took. And somehow that is the one that ended up on the back of the city <laughs> report. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is so funny. So, Jim, uh, quick question. Uh, there was a reference in the consent agenda to a resignation, but I don't see anything in the packet on it, so I'm not sure what it is. The resignation of Pierre Cotton, the assistant principal at Main Street Middle School. And so you accepted it? Um, I mean, it doesn't say what action was associated with it, like the other stuff in the consent agenda. So it's just no, I mean, I don't know what you do with the resignation and, you know, um, yeah, David, all of those kind of things, resignations and new hires go into the consent agenda as FYI for the board. Yeah. Is it the end of the school year or? Yeah. Okay. yeah it's effective at the end of the school year. Okay, cool. All righty. Hey, thanks a lot. Good, thanks, David. Um, Jill, there's a little hand in your screen. Is it there for a reason? No, it's okay. It's, I don't think so. Yeah. I've never seen it before. It's like a funny little hand signal. Okay. Uh, motion to adjourn. I move to I adjourn. Uh, <laughs> Mia, do you want a second? Yes. Uh, okay. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Amanda. Yes. Jerry. Aye. Emma. Aye. Mia. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Jill. Aye. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.